I'm Isadora Helfgott. I'm in the history department here at the university. And along with Nicole Crawford, who's the curator of collections at the Art Museum, I've had the great privilege to organize um, the visit by our speaker this week. We are very grateful to the UW Art Museum and the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research for sponsoring this event. We're especially grateful to the Office of Academic Affairs for granting the Humanities Institute in collaboration with five institutional partners here, the uh, Presidential Initiative Grant to explore how these institutions might most profitably work with each other on campus. Um, so on behalf of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, uh, I would like to give you a heads up that you'll be invited to four more events of a similar nature in the spring. The five partner institutions of the Humanities Institute include the Art Museum, the Libraries, the American Heritage Center, the Barry Biodiversity Institute, and the Humanities Council. And we'll be convening conversations over this academic year about the possibility of interdisciplinary collaborations among the, um, these institutes and the faculty on campus over the next few months. So stay tuned for more. Um, so it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Jim Harris, who comes to us from the Ashmolean Museum at Oxford University, where he is the Andrew W. Mellon teaching curator there. And he's one of four people who is working um, to, to build and grow the academic engagement program at Oxford University at the Ashmolean Museum. And the Ashmolean, as many of you may know, is an institution with a robust history that dates back to the 17th century. And as we've heard this week, has been at various times, not now, resistant to change. But they have instituted um, this program to bring, to really integrate the university into the academic life of the community. And Dr. Harris has been working actively over the last two and a half years to work with faculty, to work with students, to really activate the objects in the collection in the university community. Um, in addition to his current post as the academic curator and academic curator at the Ashmolean, Dr. Harris is a scholar of late medieval and Renaissance sculpture, in particular the polychrome sculpture of Donatello. And in reading a little bit about his work today, um, I have already experienced some of his interest in surface and the surfaces as opposed to the iconography of sculpture, which have made me think differently about objects, so you're in for a treat. Um, he's also published on Florentine painting, Vasari, and contemporary drawing, so he has interests that vary widely. He's taken an extraordinary interest in the University of Wyoming. He's seen everything from the basketball team and their victory um, on Sunday to the Biodiversity Institute today. So uh, he has learned quite a bit about us, and now he's here this evening to share what he knows um, uh, with, with us. So um, I should have said that his PhD is from the Courtauld Institute um, in London, where he also taught, and he's lectured very widely, including at the Victoria and Albert Museum and the National Gallery in London. So we're very privileged to have him here among us. Some of you have had an opportunity to engage with him in smaller groups over the last couple days. We have been running him ragged, but um, he is still uh, full of energy, which is incredible. So you'll have a sense of why he's been able to make such an impact at the Ashmolean. So without further ado, Dr. Jim Harris. Thank you. A wonderful thing you've done for me, thank you. I had visions of an empty auditorium, <laughs> which would have been fine, trust me, because at this point, before you speak, you're always wondering whether you're gonna say the right thing. And to an empty auditorium, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> so you have upped the stakes. Issa very kindly said that it was a privilege to have me here. I have to say that the privilege is all mine and the pleasure is all mine. I have not been to this part of America before, although I have traveled in your country um, and it has been beautiful. You have been endlessly and generously hospitable to me and I have enjoyed the conversations that I have had enormously because this is an institution uh, surprisingly very similar to Oxford. You have I'm not kidding, you have a similar sized student body, 10,000 or so undergraduates and postgraduate students, which is similar to us. You are a multidisciplinary research university, and you're a university which is 
become perfectly evident to me, in which the various parts are interested in working together, in which people are interested beyond their own disciplines, and people are eager to explore the ways in which the resources of this university, which include the art museum and the archives and the geological museum and the Berry Institute and the anthropological collections, you're eager to explore the ways in which those can be brought to bear upon the teaching and the research of this place. And in that, all those things, you are like us. And being here is a great delight, so thank you very much. What I'm going to do this evening is tell you a little bit about what we are up to at the Ashmolean, um, because it is a strange and hybrid beast, uh, the university engagement programme of which I'm a part. So I'll talk a little bit about my teaching and about the objects that I use in my teaching. Some of them are fabulous things, some of them are less fabulous. But I'll also talk to you a little bit about my subtitle, why it's worth looking closely at objects in the first place. And in order to do that, I'm going to take you into some of my own research. So this will be a kind of slightly uh, hybrid paper designed by a committee in which uh, you will get some of my practice and then some of my other practice. And then hopefully at the end, they will be married together in beautiful synergy and you will all see the point. And if you don't, then I will stop early enough for you to ask some questions and say, I don't get the point. However, let's hope that's not the case. When I got the invitation from Eric Sandin, <laughs> I've got to tell you, this is exactly where my mind went, because, <laughs> because I am as full as any Englishman of a stereotypical image of this part of the world. I hope that what I've said will assure you that my stereotypes have been wonderfully confirmed in the beauty of the place, in the warmth of its people, and wonderfully turned on their heads in pretty well everything else that's happened to me. That said, I still wish I was James Stewart. <laughs> and I still will, when I get home, describe myself as the man from Laramie. <laughs> so there is no getting away from this. Issa told you a little bit about the Ashmolean. I'll tell you a little bit more. The Ashmolean was founded by curious people. And at the heart of the work that I do, which is interdisciplinary, which is concerned with the close examination of things, at the heart of that is curiosity. This man with a beard and a black skull cap is called John Tradescant. And John Tradescant was a gardener. He worked for the King of England, Charles I, and he worked for many of Charles's courtiers. He was a wise man and he managed to survive the revolution. And he worked for the parliamentarians. And then when the king was restored, his son worked for Charles II. And John and his son, who shared his name, were curious about everything. They travelled the world insofar as they could. They came to America. They travelled to Muscovy and the far north of Europe. They travelled eastwards towards the Ottoman Empire. And they travelled around Western Europe, usually searching for plants and seeds because as gardeners, that was what they were interested in, mostly. But wherever they went, they collected other things. A shoe, a dried fish, an amusingly shaped vegetable. Their house became a bit like the nature table at school, full of bits and pieces, and they catalogued their bits and pieces into a, a, a proto-museum called Tradescant's Ark. And they kept it in their house in South London, and they opened it to their friends, who would come to look at the things that they had collected. And they categorised them, things that were to be worn, things that were to be worn on the foot, things that were vegetable, things that were a mineral in origin, things that were carved. These kinds of categories formed the basis of the organisation of their collection. Some years after they had opened their museum, the man in the wig came to live next door. Yeah, there was a reason for that. His name was Elias Ashmole, and he was a new man. He had made his fortune during, uh, before and during the Civil War. And he, too, was an antiquarian and a collector of things. And he was very interested in the Tradescent collection. The good thing about Ashmole was that he was a lawyer. I'm not sure that that's necessarily a good thing about Ashmole, but it was clearly good for him because he, at the end of the life of John Tradescent Jr., 
acquired his collection. His title to the collection was disputed and he went to law to prove it. But after he'd gone to law to prove it, maybe he thought he should get this thing off his hands as fast as possible. So in 1679, he offered it to the museum, to, sorry, the University of Oxford. And Oxford accepted the gift on condition that they would build a building in order to house it. And that's this building here, which was designed allegedly by Christopher Wren. We're not absolutely certain of that. And opened in 1683. One of the objects that came at the very beginning of that gift to the museum was this thing up on my left, your right, which is known as Powhatan's mantle and is an object that comes from the Powhatan Confederation of Native American tribes on the East Coast. How it came to the Tradescants is unknown, although the name of John Smith, the celebrated figure from the well-known Disney cartoon Pocahontas, um, <laughs> is sometimes invoked as the possible conduit between the tribes and the Tradescans. However, the Tradescans went to Virginia in the early 17th century, and the possibility exists that this was part of an exchange of gifts with them directly. It's not a mantle, it's likely a wall hanging, and its content is disputed, but it continues to be the subject of anthropological and ethnographic research. This kind of thing was at the heart of the Ashmolean then, which means that the Ashmolean, which now calls itself a museum of art and architecture, is necessarily an interdisciplinary, a multidisciplinary institution because we serve the needs and we meet the hunger of anthropologists and ethnographers as well as art historians, architectural historians, archaeologists, classical historians, ancient historians, regular historians, modern historians, In the mid-19th century, the Ashmolean became a bit more organised than it had been previously. Its first keepers were botanists and chemists, and their interest was in experimental science. So the museum had an experimental laboratory in the basement. But by the mid-19th century, it was felt necessary to organise the museum more properly as a museum of art. And this building was built by Charles Cockrell between 1841 and 1845, and this is the building we now occupy. It's a brilliant place right in the middle of Oxford. It occupies the site which was once the Carmelite Priory of the city, uh, which itself occupied the site of the palace of um, Henry II, the palace in which Richard the Lionheart was born. So it's a kind of place which has uh, deep roots and historical resonance to it. And it's an extraordinary place to work as a result. The things that I work with are less grand very often. These are two Anglo-Saxon brooches. They're about that big. They are very similar to one another. As you can see, they constitute a pair. They were found in Cambridgeshire in the 19th century. They came to us in 1909. And I use these uh, in a number of ways. One of the pieces of teaching that I have done repeatedly with a large number of students is to bring students of early medieval literature, people who read Beowulf, into an encounter with pieces of Anglo-Saxon metalwork like this. The things that constitute the treasure that Beowulf took with him when he travelled to the halls of Hrothgar. The questions that we ask of these things are sometimes very straightforward, but they never start with what is it you're looking at. Rather, we start by saying, what can you see? And the question, what can you see, is really at the heart of everything we do. What the university saw in the Ashmolean until some years ago was an institution which had gone its own merry way in our great kind of organisational family. About ten years ago, the Ashmolean was effectively rebuilt and it turned from being an essentially Victorian institution into being a public-facing modern museum, and very successfully. Our visitor num numbers went up hugely, our engagement with schools increased, our profile nationally was raised immeasurably, but our relationship with the university was thrown into stark relief. My curatorial colleagues have always taught, they teach in archaeology and classics and arch ancient history, but outside those disciplines, the Ashmolean was to all intents and purposes invisible. And so two of my colleagues in the museum at the time conceived a plan to increase that profile and to think of ways in which the museum might find itself 
a useful place in the teaching and the research of the university much more broadly. And that plan became, in collaboration with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, blessed be their name, <laughs> the University Engagement Programme. What can you see was at the beginning of this process. And what can you see is what happens in every class we teach. What can you see here are green objects, but one which has a kind of brown discoloration on one side. One is much shinier than the other. The cruciform point on this side of this one has been lost. So we see two objects that are the same but different. We are able to say something about their materials, this green Coloration is known to you all as the colour of copper when it oxidises. So we can say something about the content of the object before we know what it is. If we turn them over, they reveal themselves as brooches. But not before we've observed that that brown discoloration comes from the residue of an iron pin on the other side, which tells us the function of the object and tells us that this was crafted by somebody who had metallurgical knowledge of more than one material. Not only could he smelt copper, add to it the necessary alloying components to make either bronze or brass, depending on whether this was alloyed with tin or zinc, but also that he had the ability to extrude a, an iron wire and make this disc into something else, an adornment for clothes, a fixing for an outfit. For an English student to ask those questions is an interesting exercise. Partly because suddenly the texts that they read have a physical presence amongst them. And partly because when you take apart an object like this, you're forced to consider the nature of the text that you've been working with. A text arrives on your desk. Many of you are students. You have things to read all the time. A book plops its way onto your desk. You open it up. That text has been decided by someone. Someone's written it, but then an editor has changed it. In the case of an Anglo-Saxon manuscript, the manuscript itself has been copied, mistakes have been introduced, a new section may have been interpolated by a later scribe, two manuscripts may then by an editor have been compared and the mistakes and the variations between them settled in the mind of that editor and that editor has then presented a scholarly edition. This object, this text, therefore, is not simply the words it contains, but it's the processes, the physical history, which has made it. And that object is itself provisional, because in 20 years' time, one of those students will produce a new scholarly edition, and their student will produce another scholarly edition after that. And the provisionality of the text continues, and the manufactured nature of it continues. And for the student, can be grounded in understanding the manufactured nature of objects, I used that pair of brooches in a class that I taught with a colleague in neuroscience who wanted her third year medical students to be able to examine things and describe them in order to understand what it means to look at a patient and take a history. In other words, to describe without inference, to describe without prejudice, to look at things in order to know what you can actually see. One of the students in that class noted these pair of brooches and noted the difference between them, and decided that he would undertake his final school's project on the neurological phenomenon of change blindness. This is something of which I know little. But it, is, it addresses the question of why it is that we sometimes notice difference between two ostensibly similar objects, and why sometimes we don't. And so he decided to run a controlled experiment in the museum using pairs of objects which manifested slight difference. The brooches were one. These two prints, taken from the same block but using different colours, were another. These two tiles, one of which is damaged and in which the design is slightly different, were others. And in a controlled way, he asked his subjects to view the objects live in pairs, whilst at the same time broadcasting their view to somebody looking on a screen. As a result, he was able to compare the way in which we apprehend things in real life with the way in which we apprehend them virtually on a screen. Most of our encounters with things now are on screen. And what he has begun is the process of understanding whether we actually see things differently on screen from how we see them in the museum or in front of us on a daily basis.
It was a fantastic and fascinating piece of research, particularly for an undergraduate student to conceive. But it led me into collaboration further with his tutor in neuroscience, with another tutor in experimental psychology, and expanded the way in which the museum was conceived by those departments. And it started with the question, what do you see? The most recent iteration of that collaboration has been this uh, public seminar that was held a couple of weeks ago at the museum in which speakers from theology and English literature, from history of art, from uh, neuroscience and from experimental psychology all gave papers on various aspects of the mind and the brain, addressing the question of where is the connection between the object, the brain, and the person inside it. It was a wonderful evening. It was the second of such things. This is my colleague, Dr. Joshua Horden, speaking about the mind of God as a metaphor in Judeo-Christian literature. It was the second such event. The first was initiated by this object, which is a heart scarab from ancient Egypt. The heart scarab has engraved upon it a prayer. It's a prayer which the owner of the heart speaks to their heart at the time when the heart must stand for the owner of the heart at the weighing of his soul. And the heart is asked by the gods whether the owner of the heart has sinned. And this prayer says, essentially, look here, heart. We've been together a long time. Give me a break. Before I came to this moment, I had to promise that I had committed none of the sins that are listed as having to be proven uncommitted. But you know and I know that I may have done some of those things. So when it comes to it, heart, speak for me. Tell them that I'm a good guy. Tell them that my soul will weigh nothing and that I can pass over to the afterlife and not be condemned to the darkness forever. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> But that's really what's going on with that object. And I was looking at this with a cardiologist. We also looked at this, which is uh, an, by an unknown Sienese artist of the 16th century, a drawing of St. Catherine of Siena. <coughs> the title which it's catalogued with is St. Catherine of Siena exchanging her heart with Christ. But on the reverse of this is an 18th century inscription by its then owner, which says St. Catherine of Siena receiving her heart back from Christ after it has been cleansed. My cardiologist colleague nearly fell off his chair when we looked at this, because what's being described here in a kind of uh, metaphoric, symbolic, theological way is the removal of an organ, its mending and then its replacement. And those two objects led us to a seminar very like the brain seminar, but thinking about the human heart. And again, a multidisciplinary group of scholars came to the museum in order to address questions that they shared an interest in, although to which they had very different approaches. And the museum provided a uniquely neutral space for that to happen, a place surrounded by the exploration of humanity over a very long period of time, but which had no disciplinary bias towards any of them. It was an extraordinary evening, and we're hoping to do another one next year. Watch this space. I think it's going to be about hands. I work a lot with psychiatrists, and the psychiatrists are interested in the ways in which clinical issues that they encounter in their practice have been explored in drawing and prints by Western artists. When I say Western, I should point out because I've learned this while I've been here. When I say Western, I mean the Western tradition from ancient Greece forwards. And it has nothing to do with the Rocky Mountains. Well, it does. It has everything to do with the Rocky Mountains because you are part of that tradition. You also have your own. And now I know that. I will never make the confusion again. The psychiatrists, therefore, look, come and look at themed groups of drawings and prints to do with ageing or to do with uh, the experience of powerful emotions, to do with family or community to do with gender, and then we discuss together. And the discussion is theirs. I will lead the discussion. I will give them information about the objects. And if they want to, that's where the discussion will stop. And we'll think about these things as pieces of art. Where it's much more interesting is when they engage, as they did with this, uh, this fantastic drawing by Rembrandt, 
of his father led to a long discussion about how the psychiatrist will respond physically to the presence of the elderly person who comes to visit them, where they will place themselves, how they will sit, whether they will stand, how they will show the patient in and out of the room, the way in which that physical encounter is mediated for the best clinical advantage for the patient. And that's what this drawing did. Similarly, this drawing by Michelangelo led to a discussion about the varieties of grief, about the responses of their patients to situations of bereavement and loss. And you're looking at something that is one of the most extraordinary products of the human hand and mind. So it is a great privilege. And it makes it look, when I talk about it like this, and my colleagues could show you similar objects and talk about work with geographers or with classicists or with lawyers or with mathematicians, but those are not departments with which I primarily work. We could all show you great things like this, but actually most of what we do, going back to those two little brooches, is with much more prosaic things. And we do things that people don't expect, or we try to. If they expect it, then we've kind of lost the battle. Recently, I was working with some art historians, and the question at issue was of formal analysis and style. Formal analysis is easy to get hold of because you look at something, you ask them to describe it, you steer them away from making assumptions, as we do with any other discipline. But style is different. People assume that style will be imposed on an object by the personality of its maker. And people assume that style is the preserve of things that we understand as sculpture or painting or drawing or design or architecture. And so instead we looked at a group of prehistoric hand axes. This one, which is uh, an amazing twisted oval which sits in the hand very beautifully. And where the twist is not necessary to the function of the object but has been added as a way of making it different. The question of whether style, therefore, applies to objects which we regard as purely functional uh, was at issue there. We carried on looking at other kinds of hand axe and realised that actually mimesis was important at a date when we wouldn't imagine it to be the case. This jadeite hand axe on the left is of somewhere between five and 4,000 years BC. The source for this stone is known from only two places in the Alps, one on the border of Italy and France and one in the mountains just behind Genoa on the Ligurian coast. That source was only established in the last 10 years. But we find these things as far north as Caithness in the very tip of Scotland and as far south as Sicily. So they were being traded along enormously long networks. And along those networks, we find other stone which has some kind of similarity. This one was made in the Lake District of England from a green local stone. And my colleagues in ancient archaeology and prehistoric archaeology believe that the chromatic similarity between the two objects lies at the heart of making that one, that this desirable material was sufficiently uh, precious for other makers in other places to try and repeat its beautiful greenness in whatever they had to hand. Style here is a question of copying and sharing. These are three objects which um, you will find in pretty well any museum that has anything from medieval Europe. They are little copper alloy boxes with gilding and enamel. They have a particular function which they share. And these are all in quite good condition. These are all on display in museums. One of them is in the Ashmolean, the other one in the Louvre in Paris. I work with this one, which is their sad, neglected, knackered cousin. You have to remember that everything in a museum, every object in every museum in the world shares only two characteristics, but they all share them. One is that they are out of context. The object is by itself. It has no relationship to the place for which it was made. The other is that they are fragmentary because they have been removed from their context. Some things are more fragmentary than others, though, and this one is pretty fragmentary. Its enamel has been chipped off, almost completely off the lid and largely off the base. Its interior, which was once gilded, has been scratched and scraped and 
the copper is bleeding through the gilded inside. The pins which attach the lid to the container are gone. But this is a fantastic object to interrogate with students because in its brokenness, it tells us something about its physical history. It tells us something about its formal content. It tells us something about its iconography. It tells us something about its manufacture and its materials. And it therefore can be a resource for thinking about any number of different issues and questions. This is the most agile object that I have ever worked with. And this is an object which encourages the minds of students to become as agile as it. When you start looking at it and you ask students to say what they can see, they have no information about this. If you're a psychiatrist, if you're a neuroscientist, if you study English literature or theology, you come to this object as a first or second or third year undergraduate with no background. You can see how big it is. It's about 50 millimetres deep. You can say something about what it's made of. Inside, you can see this green, so you know that there is copper present. You can see that gold has been added to the copper. And if you look closely at the exterior, you can see that there was once gold on the outside as well. You can see that the colour comes from a thick substance, not from a thin coating of paint. And you can begin to unpick, therefore, its materials and the mode of manufacture that you're dealing with. Those fittings on the ends are riveted on. And you can observe the rivets. The whole thing is comprised of a single strip of metal which has been curved around and soldered down one side. And you can see the seam. The base is an added piece of copper, and manifestly a different metal from the sides. The lid has a rich iconography. It has two texts on it, the two trigrams, IHS and the Cairo. In other words, the name of Christ, Jesus Christ. And between the two texts are two angels in roundels. So what you have here is an object on the lid of which is the person of Christ enthroned by angels. It's an object of some sumptuousness. Imagine this was once gold and fully coloured. A fully coloured golden house with Jesus' name on the top and two angels lifting him up. And then you begin to ask, well, what is it? But only then do you begin to ask, what is it? Because by then you've observed enough to say something useful about its function. And what it is, is a container for the wafers of the communion, the host. It's a pix. And it's a pix which has been used and used and used. We can say something about its use. We can say something about the way in which enamel sticks or does not stick to its copper alloy substrate. We can address this thing from any number of disciplinary perspectives. These are 12 departments in the University of Oxford, and I have taught with this object in all those departments. And in every case, the discussion starts in the same place. What can you see? And it finishes somewhere pertinent to each of these disciplines. And that is the agility of the object. The agility of the student and their teachers on the faculty is to make the connection. But the process of making the connection is the thing which makes all this worthwhile because it is a process not only of observation but of logical progression, of investigation, of investigative research in a few minutes in a study room in a museum. And museums represent whatever their content, the richest possible resource for doing this kind of work for enabling the student to step away for a, mo for a moment from the text in front of them or from the classroom in which they normally receive instruction and enabling them to look in a different way, to look in a new way, to be refreshed in their looking, if you prefer. And for the faculty member, it offers an opportunity to bring to bear on the student's teaching and instruction questions which might not directly pertain to the set text. You come away from the textbook for a moment and you look at something which leads you back to your own discipline but with fresh eyes. One of the brilliant things about my visit here is that when I arrived and I was in the museum for the first time on Monday, uh, 
um, Nicole took me and Issa and one or two other colleagues down to um, the stores and the stores of the museum. Stores of any museum, it's the best place to be because that's the stuff that's not on display, that's waiting to work. It's waiting to do its job. And on one of the shelves, we found a group of um, things like this. Now, I'm in Laramie, in Wyoming, so someone must know what this is because you've all ridden horses. This is a stirrup. And it's part of a group of other cast metal stirrups of some age, although not clear what age, because the information that we have about them is limited. But this is a particular kind of stirrup. This is a conquistador stirrup. That is to say, a model which was developed in Latin America and was later used by uh, the gauchos on the Argentine pampas. It encloses the foot. It's quite a tight fit. So you imagine this gaucho had quite a small foot. This object will function in precisely the same way that that pix will function. This is an object which will give itself up in any number of ways. These are undergraduate courses in this university. And every one of these undergraduate courses will approach this object in a different way. And when you start with the question, what do you see, you will get to a different place. Some of those disciplines will have a conversation going on. This morning we had a brilliant time in which a poet and a microbiologist were talking about their collaboration. And we looked at a couple of stirrups together. And there was work to be done very clearly between them and objects. There was an anthropologist present. He's here now, I'm delighted to say, which means it can't have been a catastrophe. The approach you might take to this from an anthropological standpoint is as various as this number of disciplines. You could think about it as the centre of a social network. You could think about it as the product of an environmental interaction. Because to make this, you've got to mine something. To smelt it, you've got to burn something. You've got to chop down a tree and make charcoal. You've got to make props for your mine shaft. You've got to remove something from the ground. And you've got to set up an industry in order to produce an object like this. All those things feed into the work of geographers, feed into the work of those who study the environment and natural resources, feed into those who study business networks and economics, feed into the work of those who want to understand why we arrive at particular forms for useful objects, how function feeds into the shape of things. Geologists will look at this in a different way from philosophers. Kinesiologists might wonder, how you're going to work with your body in a stirrup like that. But they will all start by saying, what can I see? Because it's only by understanding what you see that you're able then to take the step out into your own disciplines. I have no idea who I'm talking to, but I hope you represent a fairly wide span. I know you do, because I know who some of you are. Um, a fairly wide span of what this university teaches. And what is taught in this university will find useful connections to be made at its art museum. There are more obvious connections to be made, but no less useful in the geological museum, in the anthropological collections, at the Berry Institute. But when you consider these things together, they become an extraordinary resource for teaching, for research, for giving students the opportunity to think in new ways, to become more agile. And the business of looking, which seems so simple, the business of looking which seems so basic, which seems kind of below our dignity in some ways, when we're presented with complex arguments that have been fought over for centuries and written down in texts for us. The business of looking which seems so paltry in comparison with some of that endeavour is in fact a way of accessing some of that endeavour, of understanding it better. And the resources to do that are all here. Your museum has more things in it than you realise. Because it's a museum which is led by temporary displays of art, the permanent collection is, it's down there, fermenting, waiting for you. There are stirrups, there are also African fetish objects, there are Papua New Guinean things, there are things from Easter Island, there are works on paper that represent the whole span 
of Western art history. My Western, not your Western. There are paintings which represent the whole of your Western art history. But you can go to the art museum here and you can see Dürer at work. Or you can see an 18th century portrait engraved of a sailor, which will make you ask the question, why did he want to be seen like that? Who was looking at this? Who bought this? Who was it made for? How much did it cost? What was the process that went into making it? Where did the copper come for the plate that printed this image? And why is he wearing that uniform and not another one? All those questions in a single print. All those questions in a single stirrup. And all these possibilities, all this potential in objects that you might otherwise pass by. I was going to talk about my research, but actually I think it would be much more interesting if I shut up and we had a discussion and you asked me some questions um, and I attempted to either to answer them truthfully or to think of a good lie on the spot. And so I will stop actually because we've arrived at a point I think which is uh, a useful and interesting one for here. And although Donatello is fabulous, you don't need to know about him tonight. We can do that another time. And I'll gladly come back, by the way. <laughs> by the way. <laughs> and so for the moment, that's it from me. Um, this is what I do. This is what my colleagues do. And this, and this is the point at which I suppose I get to the numb of it. This is what I think you should be doing. This is how I think you should be using your university museum. This is how I think you should consider your collections. This is a kind of instruction research to which you have access, for which you have the skills, and which I think will enrich what is already an extraordinarily rich teaching and learning environment. You will become more agile. Your students will become more agile. The syrup will sit on the table. But really, it's the most agile thing of all. Enough. Ask me a question. Okay, yes, you. Successfully able to work with professors and those that are organizing classes so that they can meet accreditation using mm -hmm. these types of experiences. That's a very good question. Um, Our work works in, we work in two ways. Um, one is in, if essentially curricular support. So a professor who's teaching a particular class, we will encourage and cajole and bully and nag until they come with their students to the museum for one class during that course. So it will be included in the curriculum by our colleagues and we will teach the class as a part of that course. So what we've tried to do over the last two and a half years is essentially crack open the curriculum so that our colleagues are willing to include this work. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that we've begun to do and which we're being encouraged to do by the university more and more is to co-design courses. So to work with faculty, perhaps who've already brought their students in once or twice, to think about ways in which a more extended engagement with the museum might be possible. What we hope to do is continue with both those methods in tandem because the amount of time and labour that goes into a co-designed course and its instruction is very considerable for what might be a relatively small number of students. Whereas in a department like English literature, for instance, where we have 240 undergraduates every year, the possibility for addressing a lot of those undergraduates by a series of colleagues bringing students in to do a similar project um, is very great. So we're striking a balance between curricular support and the insertion of these discrete units within into the curriculum and developing new curricula ourselves and in collaboration with our colleagues. How did you start? Um, in the sense that you said that you had a kind of core group of departments that, would, that were naturally interested in this kind of collaborative work, yeah. and they're easy to reach out to. Yeah. But how do you reach out to the mathematicians, which you said you haven't worked with as, as much? I have one of my colleagues. Okay, so do you go to them? Because yeah. uh, during our yeah. short, our small group yesterday, you were saying that they tend to come to you, but mm. how do you get the word out? No, it, it starts the other way. We go to them. One of the things about impact, actually, is the extent to which word of mouth spreads in a particular department, and more colleagues come to us. But we start by going to them. And th the answer to your question really is, is very simple. You, you cold call. We arrived in the museum and the university. None of the four of us had any Oxford background. None of us were educated there. Um, we all came from different institutions. One came from, um, from RISD in Rhode Island, uh, one from uh, Montclair State University in uh, 
New Jersey. Um, I came from the Courtauld Institute. So we arrived in Oxford uh, naked and alone. If that's too horrible an image, just say alone. <laughs> <laughs> and it was then up to us to write to people, which is what we did. We spent our first summer and the early part of our first term just writing to people. Dear Professor Bess, I am, this is what I do, you work on something completely unrelated, but I think there is a synergy between us. Do you want a cup of coffee? It, that is the least rocket science-y part of the whole process. Rocket scientists are welcome, though. Um, we did it by meeting people, by talking to them, by buying them a cup of coffee, and then by experimenting, by getting one person, one imaginative person in the department to come and say, OK, I'll bring some students, see what happens. And then from there, it goes on. So you start with one medic, and then you get an, you start with a neuroscientist, you get a cardiologist. The cardiologist will get you a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist will get you into all sorts of places you don't want to go. Um, <laughs> a historian will talk to a linguist. One of the leading historians at Oxford is a historian of the German Reformation in early modern Germany. A lot of her work is with modern languages. And in discussion with her, I've come to work with someone in the German department and through them with two doctoral candidates in the German department who are doing a piece of research with me on an object in the museum. So word of mouth is a remarkable commodity and it's the thing on which we rely. Um, this is a university where people talk to each other. That much was evident. Issa and I went to the Berry Institute today and we stood there at the top of the stairs looking down into the space where they do the vertical <laughs> dancing and we'd been there about two minutes just chatting quite quietly, quite modestly, and the director of the institute, Carlos, came out of his office to introduce himself. And we spent the next half an hour looking around the place. This was a conversation that was serendipitous for me because it was fabulous to see a collection which I think some of you probably don't know you have, which is the Museum of Vertebrates. Hands up if you knew that there was a Museum of Vertebrates here and hands up if you didn't. There you go. There's no shame in not knowing. I didn't know. And so we saw the Museum of Vertebrates. We also saw a part of the university which is necessarily interdisciplinary and which the members of are engaged in conversation with other colleagues. So this is a place where those conversations happen. So if you find one imaginative colleague here, then that will get you ten. This is, uh, this is a process which is tried and tested. It's simple, but it does work. Going to a faculty head of department and saying, can I come and meet your faculty and sit down with them? That never works. Going institutionally downwards for this kind of work, I think, is a difficult thing to do. But if you can get the support of your institution to work upwards through the faculties, then it's a very rich way of communicating and doing business. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Were you worried about your own research? And yeah, no, I'm not at all. In fact, I'd be delighted. Let's look at it now. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my work is about the surfaces of sculpture, and I'm interested in the way in which surface changes over time, in the way it reflects changing aesthetic taste, the way it reflects um, the movement of an object, the way it will unpack the story of that object from its making and to the present day. I'm also interested in the way in which surface tells us something about materials and their use. And in consequence of that, the way in which they reflect something about the social history of the person who had the object made or who made it. Uh, this is a church uh, just down the road from the Courtswood in Fleet Street in London. There's a little pavilion on the side of it with a clock, and the clock has the hours struck by these two extraordinary figures, which are um, Hercules here waving flags. This was at the time of the Queen's Golden Jubilee a couple of years ago. I think the church warden crept up there and stuck the flags on one night. Anyway, I crept up there at the church warden's behest to take some samples of the paint surfaces of these things. And uh, it was very interesting what, was what we discovered. This is what they look like close up. And this is the surface of the foot of the East Giant. And you can see that he's been painted and painted and painted and varnished and sometimes cleaned, but sometimes not, and painted and his colour has changed. And he's been transformed again and again and again. He was built, put up there in about 1670. Since then, the church has been knocked down and rebuilt, but he survived. And every time he survived something else, he's been repainted. His neighbour has a similar chromatic history, essentially. 
Um, the bottom of the other one was slightly out of focus, but this cross-section tells us that when these were first painted, over the white ground was pink. They were pink giants, great big huge pink giants in the middle of London, standing right at the entrance to the city where the city of London meets Westminster, kind of clanging the hours in all their pink glory. But at some point not long after 1670, somebody decided that the pinkness was a bit much, and they painted them grey, and then they painted them brown, and then sort of brick red, and then they left them for a long time, and this layer of dirt accumulated, and then pink again. And then, at some point, somebody decided that instead of just layering the paint, they'd rub it down a bit. But they didn't rub it down very carefully, so we have this kind of sand picture effect going on, where the next layer of paint cuts through and across those layers to give us that effect. So I'm interested in this. Actually, I should show this. Uh, at the hotel where I'm staying uh, tonight is the conference of the uh, Wyoming Contractors Association. <laughs> and I've got to tell you, it is the world hub of trucks tonight, the parking <laughs> lot out there. I should show them this and say, look, why has the prep not been done properly on this piece of paintwork that I commissioned from you? Um, the things that we can learn are not just about the, the sort of layered history of objects. They work in other ways. This tomb, uh, made in English alabaster in about 1370, is in Northamptonshire, in the middle of England. And it, as you can see, comprises a beautiful piece of stone which is almost completely um, unpainted. But you can just see the hints on these armorials of colour. And if you look more closely at the object itself, you do find out that it is covered with traces of paint. That once this was a fabulously sumptuous, rich, coloured object. And if you look more closely still, then you discover that it wasn't just sumptuously coloured, but the materials used were of tremendous expense. That this man, uh, John Swinford, was a person of real substance. He was related uh, by marriage and by sort of in-lawship to the royal family. And the straps of his boots here have traces of their paint. And what we see when we look at it is that this fastening here was gilded. This is the gold leaf which was covering this. And this is the blue paint which overlapped the gold leaf at this point. And that blue paint was made of azurite, which is one of the two principal blue pigments of the Middle Ages, the other being lapis lazuli. Now, azurite was less expensive than lapis, but it was still pretty expensive. And this azurite is of a staggeringly dense quality. Not only is it high quality pigment, but they used a lot of it. And the other interesting thing here is that it's in an oil medium, which is to say that this whole stone thing functioned like an oil painting. And the ground which you would put onto an oil painting is not necessary because alabaster calcium sulfate provides its own ground. So materially speaking, this tells us something about painterly practice. It tells us something about the status of the person for whom it was built. And it tells us something about the desire of later viewers of sculpture to get rid of colour. So this tells us something about one kind of iconoclasm. Uh, oh, this is too long. Uh, this is a great object by Donatello, which I've done a lot of work on. Um, as you can see, it's absolutely knackered. It's been scraped and it's been repainted and regilded, and it's in a terrible state. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Oh, this, is, this would be great. I will have to come back. Um, <laughs> It occupies a space on the back of the high altar, which is in a reconstruction that was done in 1895, along with a ton of other sculpture that Donatello made. So about 27 pieces of cast bronze, including seven life-size figures. The crucifix is spurious. That was for another part of the church, although still by Donatello. Uh, lots of people have tried to reconstruct this altar. You know, over time, more and more of them. It became a kind of sport for art historians. <laughs> The most interesting piece of reconstruction was locating this thing where it was, at the back in the centre. It's the only part of the altar whose original location we actually know from an early description. But this art historian, John White, recognised that its location there beneath an iron grill uh, gave it a special place as the marker for the body of Christ. It's the entombment of Christ, and it marks the place where the host was reserved, inside the altar. So it forms a part of a tabernacle. Uh, this object was moved. It started off in the middle of the chancel. In the 1580s, it was moved to the back of the chancel. In the 1650s, it was moved out of the chancel altogether and off the altar and stuck above a door. 
in a rather tragic kind of overmantle sort of way. And then in 1749, there was a big fire at the end of the church and the whole place burned and then it was saved by St. Anthony and it was great and everybody rejoiced. Um, and uh, this man made some pictures of it and this is the devil burning the church before St. Anthony comes down and puts the fire out by miraculous rain. We lost track entirely of what this thing was made of at some point. It's actually made of stone. In the 19th century, they made a cast of it and they decided that it was actually made of terracotta, even though they were there with the object, <laughs> making a mould and taking a cast, they still didn't know what it was made of. That was largely because it was covered with paint, and it was covered with a particular kind of paint because of what it was. It's a tabernacle marker. It marks the place where Christ lives in this church, and it needed, therefore, to have certain resonances. Those resonances were absent from its material. Donatello made this out of very cheap prosaic limestone that came from the hills near Vicenza and was dragged into Padio for him to carve very quickly at the end of this whole great bronze altar project. And once he'd carved this thing, therefore he needed to disguise the fact that it was of such prosaic stuff. He did so by painting it. And taking samples, we can understand something of what the painted surface was like. All these figures depositing Christ into the tomb appear to always have had a uh, contiguous surface. That is to say, uh, they weren't picked out in different colours. This was designed to seem like a single material. The sarcophagus, with its green inlays, was designed to seem like something else, and we can still see that it was gilded. It was also, though, uh, in possession of this roundel of Antico Verde marble, and green marble was present on the back of the tomb of St. Anthony, which is why you go to Padua. You go to see St. Anthony. You don't go to see the high altar. They wanted a good high altar, but you go to see St. Anthony and you touch the back of his tomb, which is this great slab of green marble. Here are some pilgrims touching the back of the slab. So Donatello, first of all, thought about the sarcophagus and he thought, I want to make the sarcophagus like the sarcophagus of St. Anthony so that it ties in with the church. And I'll put all these green inlays so that that colour is repeated and repeated. And then I will gild it, because a container that contains the body of Christ should be golden. And when we took some samples of the gilding, we can see that it's gilded three times. Once, and then there was a fire, and on the surface of that gold, uncleaned off, there are particles of carbon black, which are the residue of the soot from the fire. So we can date the next gilding as post-1749. And then we can date the third campaign as pre-1852, because in 1852, the object was re-described and that was the last time anybody did anything to it. Uh, the surface of the um, figure sculpture is more complicated. And this is a very complicated slide, but essentially what it tells us is that it was, it was uh, repainted four times. The first campaign uh, left you with a shiny flecked surface, which looked like some other kind of stone. 1780, 1580s, it was painted brown because it got damaged and we have a contract saying you've got to repair it, and that's the repair. On top of the brown are the same particles of carbon black that we saw on top of the gilding there. So that's the fire. And then after that, and this is the great thing, they transformed it from a great big brown object into a great big gold object, and they gilded the whole surface. And there is a layer of gold going across there. So this thing was transformed. And in descriptions of that date, we have it described as tutto dorato, all gilded. And then in the 1850s, or the late 1840s, it was described as tutto dorato until the 18, late 1820s. The next description in the 1850s says it's bronzato. It looks like bronze. And so they did. They came in in the 19th century and they thought that's too shiny, it's too gold, it mustn't happen. Naughty object, they painted it brown again. So though that's the physical history, and this physical history re works remarkably well with the documented history of the object. We can trace its movement, we can trace its repair, we can trace its damage, and we can trace the taste which left it as this scrapey old brown thing that we have now. And we can trace that first surface back to a particular kind of stone, which is porphyry. Porphyry, which is stone that has royal and divine and imperial associations, which was appropriated by the Medici for various uh, of their projects, and which Donatello recognised was appropriate for the deposition of the body of Christ. Here in Mantegna's painting in Copenhagen, we can see him being laid into a sarcophagus, a, a dark, hard stone, not unlike porphyry, a dark, hard stone which is also gilded on those rosettes. <coughs> 
to this knackered thing gives itself up as a testament to what we have documented. But it only gives itself up if you look really closely. You've got to get under the skin of the object if you really want to understand how that documented physical history was manifest in the appearance of the object. And finally, there are these two tombs in London, which are part of a larger group of tombs I've been looking at. This one of a woman called Mary Dudley, Mary Howard, later Lady Dudley, and she lives in this tomb. This is her second husband. He kneels at the end because he's of lower status than her. Um, she was painted and repainted. Her sister is buried next door in Westminster Abbey, and her sister has been repainted very shiny, as you can see, quite recently. Mary Dudley tells us a lot about herself. This is not very interesting. This is her husband. His lips, oh, his lips had this kind of red glaze on them of Red Lake, which was, uh, again, a very painterly way of approaching this sculptor. sculpture. She used azurite, like John Swinford, expensive pigment for both her arms and for the cushion on which her head was laid. So this is an object of some status. Not only were expensive pigments used, but as you can see, it's been repainted over time. This man, Francis Egger, who we look at twice because I love him so much, because really, could anybody be more pleased with themselves than this? <laughs> he was a country gentleman. He came from Worcestershire in the sort of uh, West Midlands of England, and he arrived in London. He got himself a post at the Exchequer, and he made a ton of money, and he went back to Worcestershire, and he installed himself as a magistrate, and he lived high on the hog. And then when he died, he had his monument put up in Westminster, because that was where his fortune was founded. His son became an MP, but otherwise he's a really insignificant historical character. But his monument is astonishing. Not only is there this figure, but it lives in this extraordinary edicule with a text all about him, with architecture, with swags of fabric, with cornucopias of fruit, and the whole thing was painted. And the paint is largely gone. And the interesting thing here is Francis Egg he's not been repainted because nobody cared, <laughs> except Francis. He cared a lot. Nobody cared. And the fact that nobody cared is evident when you look more closely. This is what is in the niche above Francis. That is to say, it's clouds. There are trumpets and lightning bolts coming out of the clouds. As Francis, pleased with himself, realizes that the reason he's so pleased is because he's off to heaven and he's being summoned by the last trump. That ceiling has been painted with this kind of lead white and indigo color. So these are bluish, whitish clouds and they've never been touched. They are just dirty. Nobody ever went in there. On the outside, on the other hand, where it's a bit more obvious, somebody did go and touch it up. And when we look at this sample from this swag at the top of this cornucopia, we can see something quite poignant, which is that not only did nobody touch this up for a very long time, but the blue in the first place was cheap. This is smalt, which is uh, ground glass, ground blue cobalt glass, which over time goes grey. And you can see these shards of glass going grey in their medium. This was not good. And even the people of... St Margaret's Westminster decided that he needed a bit of help in the 19th century, and so they touched him up with Prussian blue. Prussian blue, uh, an artificial pigment which was developed um, about 200 years ago, and which was used here to touch up paintwork which they didn't even clean. These pieces of Prussian blue, the light patch at the top there and at this corner, are, as you can say, see, set into a rich encrustation of dirt. Francis Egyok is a poignant character, but these two objects, just in what I've been saying, will address for you questions of geology. This is alabaster, so this comes from somewhere in the middle of England, Nottinghamshire, Staffordshire, Derbyshire, that kind of confluence of counties. This is made of Rygate stone, which is the stone that was used in the Mason's Yard of Westminster Abbey. So her status gets her stone, which is there on site. It's not better stone, but its associations are good. These People address questions of history and politics. She was the daughter of a very important Elizabethan politician. He was a would-be politician in uh, Jacobean England. They address questions of botany. The indigo in that pigment is from a plant. Where that plant came from, how it was treated, and how it was made into a dye stuff is at issue here. Chemistry is also at issue here. What happens to smalt when it ages? 
architecture is here. This edicule is an extraordinary thing which has been put into one part of the church then moved to another. The question of its construction is at issue then. How do you take apart something like that? Theology is going on here. What was Francis's view of redemption and salvation? It's pretty obvious. You get summoned by a trumpet and up you go. <laughs> Fashion is going on here. Look at this robe, this fur-lined gown that Mary Dudley wears. Look at the brocaded dress she wears underneath her gown. This is an object not only whose status we know not only because of the way it was treated, but because of its content. There is a sociological question here. What was the relationship of the new merchant class to the old aristocracy in England at this time? And there's a question of gender studies. What's the relationship of this lady lying on the tomb to her second husband kneeling at the foot? How do their relations work themselves out practically? Did he inherit from her? Did her fortune go elsewhere? Was it entailed? These questions are at issue here. And therefore, those two objects work when you look at them closely, just like the pix works and just like the stirrup works, which brings us back to how useful this place is and how much you will benefit from working alongside your colleagues in the University of Wyoming Art Museum. And that's my research. So that was the whistle-stop tour. <laughs> Bet you're regretting you asked the question now. Anyway, anything else? Drink. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>